I think we are live on YouTube. Yay. So um, thanks very much for tuning in to um, the Outcast Creative. If you're one of our subscribers, thanks very much for watching and sharing our content. Please continue to do so and let people know about it. Um, we like to do interesting and challenging work. and We've also got a reviews channel coming soon. Uh, my name is Lance Nielsen. I'm one of the co-founders of the Outcast Creative. I'd like to say the other co-founder is with me, um, but that's Dickon Tolson, um, uh, who is not here presently, uh, but uh, doing an impromptu little uh, chat and interview with me is one of the three lions, Kai Bello! Yes! <laughs> um, who is an independent film production company, who also, they also run um, a yearly film festival. So if you've got a short film, you want to get into that, check out the Three Lions website. Could you just give us a quick shout for what that is? So we have creativelions.co.uk and we have the Creative Alliance, which is for our film festival. And um, that's the creativealliance.co.uk. Have a look, submit your films to us. And is yeah. it the Creative Lions or the Three Lions? Am I might get... We are the creative lions. But but people call you the three lions because there's people, three of you. Because there's three of us, exactly. It must be all that football fever that we've had. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So do check out uh, their stuff as well. They're working on a film called Milo as well, which we might mention a bit later. And you're going to get yes. to see that before the end of the year. Very exciting times. And mm. uh, we all love supporting each other's independent uh, projects. Um, so today we're going to talk about a project that I was involved in Back in 2001, wow. um, which um, the Outcast Creative are going to be doing a live read through of on the 20th of August 1989. And that was the stage play, which was a reconstruction dramatization of the Marchioness Inquiry into the Marchioness disaster, which took place on the River Thames, 20th of August 1989. Um, and there was a public inquiry which happened 11 years later. So the subtitle for the production was 11 Years Down the River. Production was supported by the Marchioness Contact Group, who represented 87 of the relatives uh, and survivors and families of some of those who perished on board that night. 51 people very sadly and tragically lost their lives. Um, I do have some pictures of the original production. So as we uh, impromptu you this interview, when I find them, I'll share screen and stick them up. Yeah, let's a have bit, a look, Lance. I should have been a bit more organised, shouldn't I? And uh, got them up, uh, had have, have them ready. But um, I'm afraid I've only just got in from running around trying to find all sorts of things. That's all right. But we can paint a picture, can't we? You can, we um, can indeed. So um, uh, fire away and I'll, I'll do my best to... Well, yeah, I've got so many questions for you, Lance. Loads and loads. So this happened... 32 years ago this month right that's and, correct yeah on the yeah. 20th of august i think um, that's the 30 is it the 32nd anniversary mass yes my strong point but and it's really weird because it still seems quite vivid in my mind and everybody else's minds i think so what i want to do first is because not everybody's going to know about this no. is i want to paint a picture for our viewers so mm. there was a party held for a banker antonio the fast i can't even say uh, his name his, um, Party held for the 26th year of the birthday party uh -huh. for Antonio Vasconcellos, his, um, one of his best friends, um, Jonathan Fang, who was a booker for a modelling agency, which I think Antonio also uh, had a vested interest in, um, organised the party for him. Yeah. And um, I think uh, Jonathan's birthday might have been around the same time. And I think it was a bit of a joint affair. And it was all their... their friends a lot of their employees uh it was a real cross section of um people from uh, all different walks of life but there was a lot of models and photographers and creatives yeah um bright young things all with you know really exciting lives ahead of them uh there was a bit of a um mr noma at the time which was unfortunately propagated by the tabloid press that this was a boat full of um rich uh, people um and co consequently it, it, because of that narrative that was really propagated quite strongly in the press there was this sort of 
message put out that we really shouldn't care about them that much. Yeah, and Hillsborough, the Hillsborough football disaster had happened the same year, only a few months earlier. Oh, wow. And I, I, and I know that Marsh, the Marchioness um, families didn't get anywhere near as much sympathy um, as the Hillsborough families did, but both of them were dealing with false narratives that were propagated by powers yeah. uh, beyond their control that were trying to diminish sympathy for both of those parties, actually. They had a lot of parallels. Um, yeah. So 40 minutes into their journey, there's a collision. And yeah. everything starts to go very quickly wrong. And yeah, right. And you've chosen to cover this. So you did the first time you covered this was three years afterwards. That's really brave. No, no, no. It was 11 years. Oh, sorry. Um, 11 years. After that's you. why the play was yeah. called 11 Years Down the River. So sorry, the, 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 it took 11 years to get a public inquiry. Yeah. The um, Margaret Thatcher was in power at the time of the disaster. Mm. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the order came down from on high not to have a public inquiry the day after the disaster. That decision was taken. Wow. Um, the reason for the disaster was there were huge dredging vessels that used to ply the River Thames at that time. They were called the Bow Fleet or the Bow, bow Boats. Right. And they were about three times the length of a, uh, three times the length of a football field, very wide. Um, and the bridges, which were quite low, were right at the back of the vessels. So they had very minimum visibility forwards. So they were supposed to post lookouts forward. And the right. Marchioness, which was just about to go through the centre arch of Southwark Bridge, the picture of which is behind me, yeah. the bow bell came up behind it, clipped it and rolled it over. Oh. Um, and that's how the disaster took place. Now, the bow boats were owned by South Coast Shipping. Right. South Coast Shipping was owned in turn by Ready Mix Concrete, which is a huge conglomerate um, international organisation. Mm -hmm. And it was said that a lot of powerful people had shares in Ready Mix Concrete, and I'm going to leave right. it there. Mm -hmm. Well, 51 people died. Yeah. Very unfortunately. And you can, I can imagine that a lot of people were really trying to shift the blame very, very quickly. Nobody's going to want to hold their hands up to that. And I think yeah. from reading um, your backstory, you really try to figure out where the fault lies because people were trying to shift the blame. So do you think that you were successful in doing that? Um. I, I, with my work, I try not to force narratives down people's throats myself. I, I right. like people, I like to present the facts when I'm doing a show of this type. Um, the salient points, what, what they need to know. I like to present them with that information and then let them decide. Right. But I think the challenge for me was identifying, because it was a reconstruction of the public inquiry, all the dialogue in the piece is all from the public inquiry, either from the original transcript or stuff I overheard the relatives say right. during um, uh, the inquiry. There's a little bit of that in there, not too much, a little bit. So the hardest part was working out who to put in because there were 67 witnesses. Right. And we included 17 of them in the end. Um, and then that's, you know, thousands of pages of, of transcripts that you then have to edit down into two and a half hours and identifying the, 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 the sort of nubs, as it were, the... The, the yeah. crucial bits of evidence that really indicated what went wrong and why. what went on. And that was going to be one of my questions because there were 51 people that passed away. Like you yeah. said, there were so, so many, so many witnesses. How did you then in that case decide on which characters to feature and yet who would help you shape the story that you needed to tell? Well, I wanted to make sure that there was a broad cross section of all the parties involved. So you had to have, People that were on board the Marchioness, yeah, um, a couple of key survivors, and I think we we had th three. We had three: Ian Philpot, Jonathan Davis, and Annette Russell. Okay, um, and then we had to have crew from the Bow Bell. So we had Blaney, who was supposed to be the lookout. He said he was the lookabout, not the lookout. Right. Um, Captain Henderson, who had had six pints before he got on the boat, according to his own evidence. Um, do you think it's safe to drive a car after six pints? I don't. Um, I one. And, uh, and it's believed that he drank quite a bit more than that. Um, and then we had uh, another one of the crew. And then it was important to have the owners and the directors of those companies represented, plus the Port of London Authority, 
plus somebody from the police who oversaw the rescue. Yeah. Um, so I wanted a cross section of all the different people that were involved at whatever stage. Right. Uh, there was another guy who was um, Kreber, who was um, Dep London, London Department of Transport. And they're the people who approve or disapprove designs that are made to existing ships. Okay. And the Marchioness, which, by the way, was one of the boats that brought back people from Dunkirk. I bet you didn't know that. No, I didn't. It was part of the little fleet of ships that went over and it oh, brought God. back about 80 soldiers, I think. Took the, right. Took the, yeah. Um, it was originally an open top vessel. Okay. And they, they enclosed the top deck. That was the first thing they did. Then they put a second deck on it. And then they mm. put a third deck on top of that. So it was quite poorly designed with the various extensions. And there was yeah. a lot of evidence about the company, Tidal Cruises, trying to get around um some of the uh um restrictions that they had right so um yeah so i mean it's really a, a play about corporate responsibility where public safety is concerned very poignant um, it's content is not going to be for everybody um because mm -hmm. it it's about that and it's about what happens um and what the people went through um and i think the biggest tragedy of all is it took so long because if these yeah. people had apologised a lot quicker and a yeah. public inquiry had happened immediately before documents had been shredded, which they were, um, and um, witnesses' memories were fresh, and it would be a lot harder for people to say, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I, think it, I think the families would have been able to move on and got closure a lot faster. Yeah. Um, but, I don't no. know, Lance. I just don't think these things change. If we look at Grenfell, I just don't know... There's so many parallels between Grenfell and Michael Mansfield, who I'm going to be playing in the read through uh, yeah. on next Friday, seven o'clock on our channel. Um, also represented the families in the Marchioness. Um, wow. uh, I'm sorry, in uh, he's also representing families in Grenfell. Grenfell, yeah. yeah, yeah, I knew what you meant there. Yeah. Wow, that's huge. Okay, so stop answering my questions before I answer them, Mr. Lance. Oh, okay. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to ask about the characters and are we going to see you in it? So you've already told us, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, you, um, I'm not... How are you preparing for your part? Uh, well, the, the thing that's different about this one is that it's it, we're calling it a live table read because all of our other online productions have been quite heavily rehearsed. Right. We were fondling around a bit in the dark with persecution because we were still getting to grips with what technically worked on Zoom and what didn't um, through, through YouTube. And performing live, don't forget, they're always live. And um, right. I think that's very important. They, they need to be live because of the energy. Mm. Um, but this one is a, is, a, is a live table read. So the cast of, I think there's about 24 of us, we're, we're around that number. We're not going to be off book completely. Right. But I have been getting off book with all my stuff because I prefer it but but this has happened quite um last minute and we were supposed to have August off um right. not supposed to, the outcast not supposed to do anything in August um so because of that Dickon and myself who's the other co-founder uh, we don't normally do big acting roles we, no we normally do a small role because we're usually co-directing something and I know only if we need to but this time we're both taking on quite quite big oh, parts. I'm so happy we're gonna see you very, it's very nice, nice to do acting because I started out as an actor and I don't get to do it very much. Yeah, and you're, um, you're so blessed. You are so talented. I think your audience kind. is going to be really happy to see you. Is Dickon going to be in it? I'm glad you got that £20 I sent you earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Dickon's in it. Dickon's playing Lord Justice Clark. Okay. Who's actually the guy who oversaw the inquiry and, and wrote the report and sort of made the recommendations. Right. I'm playing Michael Mansfield, um, who is uh, the lawyer who who um, represented the Marchioness Contact Group. There was also the Marchioness Action Group. Okay. Um, um, and Haddon Cave QC represented them, and and he's being played by Mark Sher, who, by the way, was in the original production in two thousand and one. Oh wow, that's amazing! So we've actually got two of the actors who were in the original production um, coming back. Um, for this one, for which the is table quite read. nice. That's really yeah, cool. yeah, because they've both been Mark and Robin have both done table reads with us fairly regularly anyway. So yeah. it wasn't really a big um, a big stretch for them to um, come back and do this. But um, so I'm playing Mansfield, and and Mansfield is a very theatrical 
lawyer. Um, I love that suits you. He he performs when he he um, does his cross examination, and he's extremely good at it. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm I, I decided I was going to do him, apart from the fact that it was too big a responsibility to heap on someone at short notice, is that I was there every day at the inquiry, the original inquiry. Wow. So I saw him cross-examine. I saw him do all these scenes for real. OK, so you remember him. Yeah, I do, yeah. I mean, I, my mm. memory is pretty atrocious, um, but actually reading the script um, and then listening to him, I've been watching all his... Um, testimonies and, and cross-examinations on Grenfell because it's all online. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, that's made me remember actually how he asked all those questions. So I can actually hear them all now. And, and oh some God. of the transcripts in um, the uh, inquiry were not 100% accurate because I made all my own original notes. So the lines don't always get um, written down by the stenographer quite, quite word for word. Sometimes they're not quite the same. Right. Um, that, that does happen. Um, I made copious notes, really detailed when I was there. So actually, little things have come back to me remembering, actually, he said that line slightly differently. It's quite weird being able Does that to... bug you as a writer? No, not really. I, I, oh. I made it as accurate as I, as I could. But as an actor, I'm going to inject um, all his sort of original um, nuances into mm -hmm. the performance as, as best as I can. Because I know him, I've met him many times. Okay. Uh, he's been very helpful whenever we've done a production that he's had a connection to. And right. I, you know, I've gone and visited it. Um, he, he met the actor, um, David Cade, who played him in the original production and wow. um, was very helpful, you know, in terms of just sort of telling, I would read this line like this or um, that kind of thing. So right. um, that's going to be fun. That is going to be fun. So staying true to the story, Lance, how important is that to you? How, how much creative license do you give yourself? Or do you um, very, very factual? Very, very little right. um, on this. I mean, you, you'll know we did Persecution, which um, some, yeah. of the, some of the lines, I think all of the lines were involved in. Um, and um, that um, drama, which is also a true story, there were some blanks that had to be filled in, but right. I made sure I 100% stuck to all the facts that I researched and did not embellish um, anything that I knew to be factually incorrect. Can't say the same of uh, certain other th things. No, um, let's not mention them, but it's very refreshing, Lance. It's very yeah, so refreshing. It's, it's, good, it's good to know when you're watching something to have the confidence that actually this is as it happened rather than to be sitting there scratching your head thinking, well, huh, I wonder if it did happen like that. And then having to Google to see, you know, at least if I know if I'm watching your production, I'm like 99% sure that that is how it happened. Um, I'm pretty diligent with my research and that's a big part of my process, but with a public inquiry, because it's all transcripted anyway, you have a lot less um, leeway in terms of fictionalizing anything. You can't really. I mean, you what can you change. It could, could be boring. Like, I, think the, I think the actors can bring their own right. um, shirts part to the roles, and everybody did, because you're not impersonating people, you're, you're portraying them. Right, right. Um, you know, so we're not on spitting image. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, but I don't have to really do anything different with Mansfield because he injects humour into his dialogue he is a performer and I know exactly how his nuances come in his lines so yeah. actually I'm trying to get as close to him as I can, as can. and I love that challenge it's great how um, about your other actors how have you cast them well we put it we put it out to the regular outcasts um fairly early on about 60 percent of our regular membership are women and most of the characters in the Marchioness Inquiry, all but one of the lawyers, were male. Ouch. So how um, but even that? in the original production, um, we had to have a couple of women fill in on some nights. We had a couple of parts that were double cast because we, some of our male actors couldn't do all of the shows. So I'd have a fem female actor come in and cover that lawyer, and that lawyer became Mrs. Right. Um, Chapman or, or uh, whoever. Um, so 
this is a table read. It's not a performance. We can get away with a bit more. So mm. again, we, we, we've got some of our females are reading what were male lawyer roles. Um, that's no offence intended to the their real <laughs> counterparts. Yeah, this is just a table read. Um, uh, but you know, I'm sure they'll they'll do a fantastic job. Um, the rest of the roles, um, pretty much all of our male regulars jumped at the chance of being involved because they just love acting. Yeah. We attract it's people lovely. that love acting. Um, yes. And, um, and this is why we do these, because it, acting is a muscle. You've got to exercise it. Mm. So if you've got free time on your hands and you can get involved in something that doesn't take up too much of your time and it's good work and the script is good and the character is good, it's always worth doing. Absolutely. Um, because it just enhances your own ability. I've noticed that all the people that took part in our table reads in 2020, and I think we did over 50 table reads, they're all fantastic at self-tapes now. Oh, really? Because they've had so much practice. Oh, wow. Performing on Zoom, which is a very similar process to a self-tape. It's almost the same. I need to come on more tape. I need to come on more, if that's the case. It is really good practice, and we're going to do a we're going to do a table read workshop um, online. I think this side of Christmas, uh, well, okay. I think we might do a couple of them. So we'll look out for be, it. They'll be quite popular. I found some stills of the original production. Okay. So I'm just going to share screen with you quickly, and um, yeah, let's have a look. Oh my goodness! So this is 2001. As I said, it's at the Jackson's Lane Theatre. Now on the left. This is the production. This is the original production. This we looks had, so real. We had practically no budget. Um, I just really wanted to do this thing. The signage that you can see on top yeah. of the computers, those are the signs from the original inquiry. On the last day, they were collecting them up in a bin bag and they were going to put them in the bin. And I went up to the guy and said, Can I have those? I love you, Lars. And, and I brought them all home. So we had all the original signage that was from the actual inquiry on our stage wow. um, because it was going to get thrown out anyway. Um, and where was this? This was at Jackson's Lane in, in Highgate. I think it was my sixth play there. Oh, gosh, um, it was incredible. And it was in, um, I think it was in the spring of 2001, uh, uh, end of February going into March. Okay. This is Richard Rycroft, who was in Game of Thrones, um, this is David Cage, who did a superb job of playing Mansfield. Louise Morell was also the producer on it and, and helped me. Right. And Mark Cher, who's standing playing Haddon Cave, is yeah. again playing Haddon Cave uh, in the original. This is Dave Rivett smirking at the back, and he actually ended up marrying our uh, makeup artist, who was oh, my so regular makeup cupid. artist, Christine, and they're still together. Wow. Um, we'll check you up, Mr. Matchmaker. So that's, um, yeah, I know, that's, uh, that's one. And then I've got another one here, um, which is quite a nice picture. Again, it's kind of the same grouping, but a slightly different composition. Oh, standing I cannot is, believe how real this looks. Standing is Alex Nichols, who played um, McG Andrew McGowan, who was the co, um, not the skipper, but he was like the first mate of the Marchioness. But right. here um, he's playing Meeson, okay. um, a, a mm. QC who assisted um, Michael Mansfield and he's questioning a witness. Um, this lady is playing Eileen Delalio, mm. um, who actually became a re the real Eileen Delalio. Um, that's Noelle Remington playing her, um, became a really good friend of mine. She sadly passed away in um, the 2000, early 2010s, I think. Um, her son, of course, is Lawrence Delalio who used to play for the rugby. Yes, okay. Um, we've got, funnily enough, we've got Sebastian Story, who plays Meeson in the read-through, waiting in the waiting room, so I might bring him in in a second. Yeah, do. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for a timely moment. Um, oh. Yeah, so, so that's, Lance, that's a couple when, of skills. When we did Persecution, we yeah. were lucky enough to actually have, in the audience, family members of um can't remember who it was but we had family members of the real people of m persecution um, there were there it, were there were some people that watched that were directly involved that were directly involved i knew i knew someone who was on the inquiry team which was yeah. a huge gold mine of information 
And then so, um, the, the sister of Barry George. That was it, the it. sister of Barry George. Yeah, yes. which is a different case entirely. That's a whole other yes. can of so worms. If that happened again, how would you want them to feel about the work that you're producing? What do you want them to take away from it? Uh, are you talking about this project? Yes, about this project. In terms of the... It family. could happen. You could have people who are relatives of people... Oh, on no, absolutely. Um, you see, the... I thought about that because the the, the play the play is getting published um, this month. That was the, one of the reasons the incentives for doing this, because mm. all of my plays are going to get published now, so that they don't get lost for all time. And um, I wondered actually whether this play was relevant. Um, and, and a lot's happened in my life since then. And I, I, I mean, I can't even remember directing it to tell you the truth so long ago. Yeah. Um, but. Um, uh, I started reading through it and I've also, like I said, I've been watching the Grenfell exchanges because I used to work near Grenfell. So I really, I felt that tragedy. Um, I, I went up there the, the next day, you know, it was horrific. Yeah. And, and it was all unfolding live on, we, we, we were watching the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the Facebook messages. Mm -hmm. They were coming up on my timeline. Yeah, from I was the woman on the, the, the watch, top floor. Yeah. Me, me, Sharon Sorrentino, my casting director, was round for dinner that night. Um, uh, you know, and and the three of us, we were we were watching it all unfold. And I, I know this is really I bad. Know. And the way that that's been dealt with actually makes me feel sick. But yeah, anyway. there's a lot. Yes. There's a lot of reading of the evidence there. I mean, somebody younger and more energetic than me should probably do a play about that. Um, mm. I did think about it, but I'm not. I'm not going to do it. But um, but but there. The, the, to answer your question, there's mm. so many parallels. Even though this disaster happened on a boat and it was public transport, yeah. when it comes to the culture of safety, yes, and how that is ignored constantly, or, or it's always at the bottom of the the pile because yeah. it, it's money's all about at money, point. yes, corporate corporate greed and lucrative private contracts, and there's a lot of that going on with um, Grenfell. Um, that that parallel is still very prevalent. Absolutely. Uh, um, I thought, actually, do you know what? This play is still very relevant, the core messages. Also, the core messages of, of an apology from, yes. from the people that have, you know, wronged somebody. If that comes in a lot faster, I know it's hard because it's all about legal admissions and this kind of thing. But you know what? It'll, it'll, people will forgive faster. Absolutely. Um, and people are prepared to apologise. So because these things are all still relevant, Mm. that's why I thought, well, we should do it. Um, we had the support of a lot of the um, people that were connected to it before, and a lot of them came to watch it Okay, um, as hard as that was for them, and they were very pleased. We didn't have the support of everybody because there were different factions within yeah. um, uh, the people that were affected by it. And, and that, that's always the case because divide and conquer is the biggest, you know, the oldest game in the, in the book. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, we're not going on national TV. It's it's a it's a table read on our channel. Um, I just hope it will it will make remind people that the legacy of of, of um, those that perished was actually massive improved safety on the river. That yeah. happened as a direct result, not only of the disaster, but yeah. of the relentless campaigning by a core group of families who yeah. brought about the public inquiry, which in turn brought about improved safety on the river. Well, and that's so something. There's a message there that there's there is power there. Yeah. Um, yeah. and and their passion, it has been acknowledged, but I I, I think there's nothing wrong. But we with don't want it to be forgotten. Again. Yeah, and we don't want it to be forgotten. I don't think, I think the legacy of of Marchioness should be forgotten any more than Hatfield or no um, Herald of Free Enterprise or Hillsborough. Um, Absolutely. there's a new drama series about Hillsborough coming out called Anne about Anne Williams, who was one of the biggest campaigners. And they haven't been able to release it because of legal cases that are still going on. Oh, wow. And I can't wait to see it. But, yeah. it, you know, because I met Anne Williams, I've got um, photographs of her, and she was a lovely, passionate woman. Gosh, um, you are so who good. Who lost her son um, at Hillsborough. And Eileen Delalio was the same. You know, she's a very passionate woman who lost her daughter, and, and she spent an awful lot of time talking to me about everything, all the different aspects of the case. And, as yeah. the Burke's family, who I need to give a shout out to, uh, and I'm not in touch with these people anymore. Um, 
and I, I have tried to reconnect with some of them, but everybody's sort of fragmented and yeah, because of, moved yeah, to Australia and this kind of thing. Yeah, families move on, don't they? We've got um, two actors waiting in our guest room. Shall we bring them in? Yeah. And I'll just yeah. say, mention who they are. So Sebastian and, Story is playing um, Meeson QC, who I mentioned, um, and he's playing Jonathan Davis, because most people play two, two roles oh, in okay. production. Yeah. Uh, or a lot of us did, about two thirds of us did. And Jonathan Davis was one of the survivors. He's the first witness. And that's also oh. a role that I played in the original. OK, well, let's um, see him then. Robin, um, Robin Hayter, who's coming on as well, is playing Henderson, the okay. captain of the Bow Bell, and one of the uh, other lawyers in the production. Welcome, Sebastian. Oh, Hello, good background. Sebastian. And um, we've also got, oh, he's gone again. And we've also got Robin. Um, hello, Robin. Hello, hello, Robin. Good evening. Hello. Good live evening. From, live from Bex Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Really so, uh, nice for you to be here. Yeah, quite Bastian, do come on if you can hear us. There you go. There he is. Yeah, just sound out our sound. <laughs> um, nice to meet you all. Robin and Thank Sebastian you. meet Kai Bello, who's Hello. part of the Creative Lions, which is an independent production company. We've done a lot of mutual support of each other's. Yes, and I've just been here hearing about your fabulous project that you're both um, working on. So, how have you been finding it so far? Fantastic. Yeah, it's um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with the Outcast Creative again on this production. And, you know, some of the projects that we worked on up to Pressure Night, 13 Seconds in Kent State, they focused on the tragedy of, of uh, you know, these circumstances. Um, and, you know, they I think they, they relate in such such a, a hard hitting manner. It's so relevant to today. Yeah. And doing something like the Marchioness, I mean, 51 people now, um, you know, uh, passing away from, from the accident, it's, 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 it's awful. And to do something with that is, you know, to really uh, bring it, bring a message with a, a new production is, is, is really cool to be a part of. So, yeah. I don't think Sebastian had ever heard of the disaster before this either. No, but my family, my family has spoken about it and that's how I've sort of, I heard about it over the last few weeks when I've been speaking about it with Lance. You know, we we sort of had okay. conversations around the house, yeah. and it's been it's it's been really um, enlightening in a way. You know, it's it's another really tragic accident that's that's gone on in the past. You know, it's um it's, it's awful, and and the character that uh, I play, Jonathan Davis. Um, you know, he, he talks about witnessing um uh, some, some of the it's, it's some of the crew members drinking, isn't it, Lance? Um, in it. Um, uh, he did, it, yeah, well, he he saw um, two what could have been two glasses of, of shandy being brought to the wheelhouse mm -hmm. um, of the Marchioness. I I need to say I personally don't think the crew of the Marchioness were drunk. Uh, right. I, I, I personally do not think they'd been drinking. And even if those glasses were beer, there was so little time between them arriving in the wheelhouse and the actual accident. It was a matter yeah, of minutes. 40 minutes. They wouldn't yeah. have. Well, it was even less than that because he's mm. the beers arrived in the wheelhouse only minutes before the accident. Right. So, so they wouldn't yeah. have even had time to consume them. Right. Anyway, but I personally don't believe, uh, I, I, I think Andrew McGowan in particular was a very competent crew member mm -hmm. and, and gave his evidence very um, articulately. Oh. Rob, okay. jump in. And Robin, that. what are you? What can you remind us the role that you're playing? Yeah, well, I'm I'm playing two roles. So I'm playing a uh, QC, okay, called uh, Thwaites. And uh, the interesting thing about this guy is actually he's one of the old school QCs. He's quite theatrical. He's right. kind of an actor, and he kind of um, he tends to, you know, befriend at one moment and then coming with a sort of sharper question very clever guy I, he's actually i think more he reminded me a bit of lance actually because of uh, all <laughs> the, lance's preparation for everything is absolutely meticulous absolutely you know, from everything i know about him and from shared friendship with a shared friend i had with lance who knew him very well lance is great in attention to detail is absolutely perfect now thwaites uh has said that the the, the true quality of a, of a really good um, QC or uh, is to or counsel is to prepare your case. You have to know absolutely everything there is to know about the case. 
And right. that's the true success of a of somebody, particularly defending council. He, he, I think he actually he's actually representing the Metropolitan Police here. That's right. And really, he kind of he's really there to kind of make sure that there's you know that the the, the, the police are completely uh, you know free of any kind of exonerated of not doing their job properly or anything. Right. Like that. He's very clever the way he sort of puts it all forward. So that's a great pleasure. And then uh, uh, it's quite challenging because I, I also playing um, Captain Henderson, who was the, the, the skipper of the dredger that went into the Marchioness. Oh. And he's from uh, Newcastle originally mm. and lived in London for some time. And as we know, if, if anyone's studied the, the details, is a bit of a past history uh, getting busted for sort of drinking I mean, a pint somewhere when he was on another ship and he got sacked and then he sort of he was sort of um, had their own way he was kind of paid a forfeit for that and uh, and he um, you know, things like you know he he left out the details when he applied for another job because he wanted oh. a job doing another one he didn't tell them yeah he covered, he covered it up yeah so the Q oh he forged it yeah so the QCs kind of you know, they, they, they having a field day uh, with a guy but um I think it's very interesting because um whether or not uh, you believe him uh, in, in, in his honesty or that the, the point is it's uh, for me it's very much like um you know <laughs> and I come from an era I can still remember unions and I can still remember uh, uh, the solid, you know, sort of a certain solidarity and a certain certain feeling of, uh, you know, you, you're sort of a working person and you're mm. doing a particular job. And uh, I think there's a whole class issue in, in this play as well. Yes, there's loads of different aspects of it. Mm. So I, I find it absolutely uh, fascinating. And um, interesting enough, we were trying to kind of do some re research on the guy. Um, one minute I thought he was from Yorkshire and then he was from Newcastle. So there's kind of accents to do. Anyway, it's it's challenging and um, I'm really pleased to be involved. We love a challenge. We absolutely love a challenge. OK, so what you've got to do now for the audience is you've got to present present yourself without really swaying us. We've got to try and make up our mind because you've already given us like a kind of opinion about, you know, he was drinking well, or may not have been. So, so how I so say, how do you play that? How do you how do you play that? Um, and let us let us make our make up our own minds without swaying us. How do you how do you approach your acting? Well, I think it's the same with um, any character you play. Anyone will tell you. Uh, I think was it Robert De Niro said uh, you've got to justify. So you do something and to yourself you have to justify why you are like you are, why you say what you say and why you are your history, all that kind of stuff. Right. You're in some kind of truth. So I think if you can, I think that my opinion, the job of an actor is to try and get some of that truth and somehow for that to come through in, in what you're, you're doing. Oh, right. so that, that's what I'm into. Yeah. And the rest is a collaboration with the other actors. You know, the great thing about this is a kind of a, I'm not sure Lance will agree. It's a kind of a table tennis in a way, in this kind of scenario, because you, know, you say one thing and the other person says the other, and it's that kind of back and forth, which is the joy, I think, of, of doing this. I mean, it's a serious subject, of course. But I mean, mm. I personally, I, I, I used to go on disco boats when I was younger in London a lot. I went on right. famous boats loads of times, these pleasure boats. You know, you got on a Charing Cross, whatever, you went up to Greenwich and then you went past Millwall or something. And you all like having a good time, boogieing and funky, great music, all getting sort of, yeah. But when you're when you're there partying, you're not you know, you're not working, you're partying, you're having a good time. Right. But all these things that I've looked up about the details of this particular one, I mean, I, I just remember it so clearly. Yeah. Being on those boats and the water level being just sort of <laughs> just below the edge of the boat, and you thinking, God, you know, what if something happens? Oh, oh come on, they'll deal with it. You know, they're professionals and all this kind of stuff. Right, right. right. And then now we're sort of in the driving seat and to play these characters. So I think it's fascinating. I think you're a great QC, by the way. I think Lance has cast you really, really well. I can't. Well, I haven't started yet. already. This is me. This isn't the way. I know. <laughs> I'm really well, maybe I should do more of me. <laughs> <laughs> and Sebastian, this is a true story, and it's a huge, huge responsibility to do this well. How are you finding that? 
it's yeah fe- feeling feeling the pressure um i know it's online but you know it, it is as you say it's still that responsibility to you know it's true to life yeah. um when i was working on kent state i had the the option of speaking to someone who who actually lived through the events um yeah you well, spoke to dean kayla didn't you i i, I did um yeah. that was just it was mind blowing, you know, hearing it, you know, from from him. Um, but with this, you know, I I haven't quite quite got that option. So you know, speaking speaking to Lance and speaking to people who have actually been through, you know, really, you know, seen it and, and been there at the time, you know, and that that's that's really really useful and it's really you know helps me ground myself in the situation. So yeah, absolutely. And the thing that I I find about plays like this in particular is that it is just factual it's not a tabloid newspaper that is trying to has their own agenda you know when you read things in the paper you you, your 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 thoughts are really skewed and you have to be really really careful to try and find information on the other side but I feel like anything that our Lance puts his mind to and puts his hand to is never like that which is really really great I'm really excited really excited to see it so Lance this is for you Hmm. So this goes out on YouTube and all the broadcasters hear about this fabulous table read that's <laughs> happened. <laughs> and they're all like, Lance, we want you to work for us and get this on screen. Who are you picking? Um, I mean, this would work very well as a, as a like a dramatised um, play. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the first of the inquiry plays, not mine. This was the Stephen Lawrence one called The Colour of Justice, which was done at the Tricycle Theatre. Huge, yeah, huge success. I did that. Okay. Transferred to the National. Uh-huh. Uh, I, just to be clear, I had no involvement in this production. Michael oh, Mansfield yeah. QC is a character in it. Uh-huh. Um, oh. When I heard they were making it, I, I was really chuffed. Um, and I, I did go and see it. I saw it twice. Um, it was also televised on the BBC. They did a proper film of it. Mm. Um, and that worked really well. I've still got a copy of it somewhere because I recorded it on my VHS. Um, so I always thought, you know, if there was the money to do it properly, um, Marchioness would, would, would benefit from that, as would the Victoria Climbia inquiry, which we did a couple of years later and we'll be doing with the Outcast oh, Creative God. next next year. You'll be in that, Kai. Um, Victoria Columbia, oh... Yeah, that's, yeah that's a, about that off that's screen. A, that's a I, tough one. Yeah, um, really but I, I mean, if you mean who would I use, do you mean the actors? No. Who? Which broadcaster are we going for? Are we going for Channel 4? Are we going for BBC? Oh, where I see. Um, where, where would it sit well? Oh, that's a how long is a piece of string question. I think the one that's going to leave the piece alone and, and mm. let's do it, you know, truthfully, the way it should be done. Um, I'd like to bring in as many of the cast on it as possible, both outcasts and original cast. And some people would be too young or too old to play the roles they played before. Right. But you wouldn't have, the difference is you wouldn't have any doubling up. Yeah. So um, you can get away with that on stage. They doubled up several roles in the Lawrence play. Um, uh, but if you're doing a, a televised um, drama, um, <laughs> single actors all round. So you're going to have a cast of about 42 people plus your extras that you've got to populate the inquiry with who have yeah. to act because they've got to react to everything they're hearing the whole time. Absolutely, um, yeah. So the nice thing is there would be work for everybody. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would play Mansfield. I think that there would be much better choices of actors than, than you myself. You never know. You never know. <laughs> no. Robin and Sebastian, this is my last question <laughs> for you. And I've got to hop off. Is how do you prepare um for your for your characters it's because this is a table read this is slightly different yeah we're going to be a bit lazy about this and are we going to just be reading or are we going to do a little bit of prep there's well, a I, bit of rehearsal but it's very different from gone set yeah. jumping i was just going to say I, I i love to just really get stuck into this new online way of working that's really established itself over the last year i mean it's opened up so much you know but yeah. um it, you know working with the camera i I think on Zoom it is good, good practice for screen work, and I found it good practice. Um, and 
you know, I, I've worked with styles such as, you know, Meisner and, you know, um, Utah and all those different styles in the past to prepare for roles. Um, right. But with, with uh, Zoom being, you know, uh, a really different platform, it's sort of like, like how, how do I approach this and, and really bring it to life? You know, because when, you, when you're reading, you know, you don't just want to sit and read, you know, um, realistically you, you want to bring it bring it to life as because you know we're all actors you know and that's Absolutely. that's the job and I think you know having it on on screen you know um helps um you know sometimes having the text to refer to um but yeah I I think working with the, with, with the other cast because you can definitely feel that energy there I think Robin was saying it earlier about the tennis ball um thing that back and forth um and that even though it's on Zoom, I think you can definitely feel that going going through the screen. Maybe not to the extent that you would in real life, but I, I always really really trust trust that, and I, I I think that sort of that real playful feeling of bouncing off each other is, okay. is so useful. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose you can't go and do you know method acting for for something. No, you know, no, 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 no. Um, work as a radio play. If it if it if it can work as a radio play, it can work on Zoom. Absolutely, that, that's my kind of rule of thumb for a for a live performance on our channel. It's got yeah. to work as a radio play. Totally. Mm-hmm. I see all of these things. Is there a radio play with visual elements? This one just happens to be a reading rather than a rehearsed performance. Than a rehearsal. And what about you, Robin? And, and do, you, uh, do, do, do you agree with Sebastian? Can you feel that connection with the other actors as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, what I find fascinating is, I mean, I had the experience of this that before lockdown, I was three quarters of the way through a production, a, a play, um, and we had to commit it to Zoom, a reading, because, uh, you know, it was kind of like, OK, lockdown, you can't go to rehearsals, the play is off. The dates we had, we had several dates in various places. I mean, this isn't with uh, Outcast Creative. This is with another production company. Mm. And I was playing Graham Green, a fantastic part, and a brilliant play um, by Deborah Clare, who's a, a fantastic playwright. And we just had to shut down shop. So I thought, well, let's, it was my idea, well, let, let's do a Zoom reading. So um, we set it up a bit like this. In fact, there are about the same amount of people that are on screen right now. And... Um, had the benefit of so I knew it was going to happen well what I did was I record we, we, I recorded the whole thing on the zoom reading and actually had the director like you know, Lance, Lance is in a different, different situation because he's he's directing and he's playing uh, one of the characters but on, on the thing that we did we had the director and her, her little sort of box in the corner and then we were doing our reading uh, like uh, this kind of setup um, I think a few props actually had a few props and things um, but after that, after we did the whole thing, and it went you know, very well, and uh, after I did the whole thing, I was able to edit it together in terms of uh, putting a few little images here and there and the nice. sound and some music and a few effects. And I took out uh, <laughs> Philippa's box, the director, I took her out of it, <laughs> so it's just the actors. And it became like a little film, like a Zoom online play. Mm-hmm. And... Um, with a bit of acting, a bit of trickery, and a bit of sort of art post production, mm-hmm. it's almost like an, an online thing. So in a way, I had some kind of. It was different then because we'd done so much rehearsal in the live theatre. Mm, yeah, we right. could of course bring all that to, yes. to to the recording. But I think that sense of, I mean, I you know, Lance's got more experience than I have on this is this virtual stuff. But I my sense is that if you are connecting, you're connecting. And I don't think it matters whether you're on a screen or you're in a theatre, because what is important is the content of what you're doing. And I go back to that original thing that, that, that they always say, you know, without a decent script, you know, you, you haven't got anything. But if you've got a great script, great material, and you can kind of connect with that in yourself, yeah. That truth should come through what you're doing and other people pick up on it, whether they're on another side of the screen or in the same room. That's my feeling anyway. Right. I agree. Um, I think I agree. Do you all still get nervous on screen? Because I did. I'm I'm going to be really nervous because I haven't done a part this big Ooh. for quite a long time. <laughs> and I've got a massive speech at the end. So, uh, and I've been doing a lot of rehearsing on it just because I, I, you know, even though it's a table read, I still want to, 
do do the part. Oh, yeah. I know Michael Mansfield will watch it. So yeah, well, we want to nail these things because it's based on real life, uh, and unfortunately, yeah. I, I can't have any live footage of the one of the characters I'm playing. But uh, so I have to sort of trust my instinct on that. But um, I think it's um, yeah. I mean. <laughs> It's going to be a challenge. Any any work is a challenge, and uh, to have these sort of two different parts completely sort of different. Yeah. Um, but I'm really looking forward to. So how I, I just do my best, like anybody, I suppose, just do my best. Oh my god! Well, you've yeah. been really inspiring, all of you, and I tell you why. That the, the most that the most inspiring thing is the amount of homework that I've heard you say that you do. You've been looking for footage. I mean, we know Lance. Lance is the homework king. <laughs> and and yeah. you Sebastian you're, you're the same you've been trying to find people and it's honestly it's so inspiring for me and it's actually a kick up my bum as well to remind me that if I do get a part <laughs> you've got to do the homework you have to, you can't skip it can you you just can't get away from it if you want to do the part of justice you have to do the homework every tutor says it so. yeah. I, th I think there's a that sorry to interrupt you I think I, I think that there is something in that because I think that it's just one thing. It's sometimes just one thing somebody will say, even in a, a, something like this, we all get together. One thing that somebody might say, or one thing that you'll see written about something. I know with the Thwaites QC, which is the first character I was looking into and researching, looking back at the history of him, maybe, and there was something about, you know, it was this thing about a lot of QCs these days. It's more, it's kind of factual, it's forensic and everything, but they steer away from that kind of old school theatrical. Oh, uh, now not to say that he's over the top um, right. in that way, yeah. but he is still described as being quite kind of theatrical. <laughs> early, right. You know, so it's just one thing that you read about it, and it, yeah. I think it gives you a little bit of an insight, something to go on, and that's yeah. all. As an actor, I think you try and you get one thing, maybe, or if you're lucky, more than that, and then you go with it. So, mm. but we'll see at the end of the day. I might be rubbish. So. <laughs> before, we, uh, before we wrap up, I've got one more picture to share. This is the whole cast from the 2001 production. Wow, um, that's, that's an incredible picture, gonna, um, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just going to express my thanks to them. I won't name them all now because um, there are so many but we wouldn't even be able to do the read through um, if they hadn't put the time and effort in, in 2001 to bring the play to life. Which wow. At the time, bearing in mind, it had almost no budget. I think the budget was like 800 pounds or something. Um, uh, uh, you know, it was an absolutely crazy proposition. Um, mm. I was so determined. And Tony Perks, who lost his brother, Stephen, is standing next to me. Wow. Um, there at the back, I'm mm. almost unrecognisable with my ponytail. Is that you, Mr. Lance? That is me standing there, yeah. And oh, uh, there's Fiona, who's well. another one of the outcasts who's going to be coming on uh, also on the read through, just doing a small, small part. Oh, excellent. So, uh, yeah, big thank you to uh, the original cast for the production. Um, wow, that's incredible. I mean, it's a little bit like we were saying before that. The, advance, the chance that I had before with, with a sort of there was all that history before we were, did our reading with you personally, Lance. Is all that production that you'd already written together with these people, and you, you brought you bring all that here to the table. So we've got, all got the benefit of that. So yeah, it's very, it's very interesting to read it again after all this time, and it will be interesting to see how people respond to it and if if they feel it's relevant. I hope they do. I think there's a serious message in there. Absolutely. Um, that's still relevant today, especially in the wake of Grenfell and, um, you know, the, with the public inquiry, which is still going on and I think is one of the most expensive in the history of this country. Um, and they're still not doing it well. But like I said, don't get me started. Lance, it might be a drama project for the creative lines. So. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> where can we see this fabulous table read? What time, um, what day? So it's going to be live from 7 o'clock on the Outcast Creative channel next Friday. It's going to stay up um, for a while. So if you can't see it on the Friday, you can watch it on the channel later. It will be on there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, run, the running time, we haven't had time. We, we haven't properly rehearsed it in the way we would like. So our pace probably won't be as quick as the original because we got it down to two hours 20. I think the running time will be about two and a half hours. Our first read through of it was a tasty three hours, you know. <laughs> 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 
We have to put a rocket under our bottom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we need to crack the pace a little bit faster. But at the end of the day, it's going to stay on there. So, you know, people can go out and make cups of tea and pause it. Or Absolutely. Uh, I was just about we'll to We'll have that. a little five-minute interval between the two acts. Okay. Um, but it's it's it is a table read. It's not as polished. It's a performance, as well. yeah. And that's Friday the twentieth, right? Friday the twentieth of August, yeah. Okay. So right. I think you said is the thirty second anniversary of the tragedy. It sure is. It was absolutely fabulous talking to you guys. I am honoured. I will be tuning in most definitely with my lions. We'll be posing questions, so be ready. Um, if you need any help, give us a shout. And oh, always yeah. need help. <laughs> we look forward to seeing it guys so that's me kai i am out of here you guys staying on no we're coming off at the same time i just want to extend my thanks to seb and rob for jumping on very last minute on a late night on a saturday great pleasure it's great. been an absolute pleasure it's been lovely thank you to kai for coming in time yeah, good to meet you kai thank you you too you well, good to meet you kai thank you okay and uh, tune in at seven o'clock do subscribe to the channel the outcast creative and we'll see